Well, here's episode three of Wikipedia Wednesday. Uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to hear it at all during this recording, but in my feet and chair, I can feel the construction going on in my neighborhood. So if there's a little background rumble, nothing I can do about that. Anyway, this week is Sir Isaac Newton was an English mathematician, astronomer, and physicist, described in his own day as a natural philosopher, who is widely recognized as one of the most influential scientists of all time and a key figure in the scientific revolution. His book, Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, Mathematica Princi Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, first published in 1687, laid the foundations of classical mechanics. Newton also made path-breaking con contributions to optics, and he shared credit with Gottfried William Leib Leibniz for developing the infinitesimal calculus. Newton's Principia formulated the laws of motion and the universal gravitation that dominated scientists' view of the physical universe for the next three centuries. By delivering Kepler's laws of planetary motion from his mathematical descriptions of gravity and using the same principles to account for the trajectories of comets, the tides, the precession of the equinoxes, and other phenomena, Newton removed the last doubts about the validity of heliocentric, the heliocentric model of the solar system and demonstrated that the motion of the objects of Earth and celestial bodies could be accounted for by the same principles. Newton's theoretical pred prediction that the Earth is shaped in an ob oblate spheroid was later vindicated by geo <laughs> geodetic measurements of Maupertuis, Le Codamain, and others, thus convincing most continental European scientists of the, of the superiority of Newtonian mechanics over the earlier systems of Descartes. Newton also built the first practical reflecting telescope and developed a sophisticated theory of color based on the observation that a prism decomposes white light into the colors of the visible spectrum. Newton's work on light was collected in his highly influential book, Optics, first published in 1704. He also formulated an empirical log of cooling, made the first theoretical calculation of the speed of sound, and introduced this to the notion of a Newtonian fluid. In addition, his work on calculus as a mathematician, Newton contributed to the study of power series, generalized the binomial theorem to non-integer exponents, developed a method of approximating the roots of a function, and classified most of the cubic plane curves. Newton was a fellow of the Trinity College and the second Lucasian professor, professor of Mathematics at University of Cambridge. He was a devout but not unorthodox Christian who privately rejected the doctrine of the Trinity and who, unusually for a member of the Cambridge faculty of the day, refused to take holy orders in the Church of England. Beyond his work in the mathematical sciences, Newton dedicated much of his time to the study of alchemy and biblical chronology. But most of his work in these areas remained unpublished, remained unpublished until long after his death. Politically and personally, tied to the Whig Party, Newton served two brief terms as a member of Parliament for the University of Cambridge in, in 1689-90 to 90 and 1701-02. and He was knighted by Queen Anne in 1705, and he spent his last three decades of his life in London, serving as warden in 1696-1700, to 1700, Master in 1700 to 1727 of the Royal Mint, as well as President of the Royal Society. That's quite the introduction. Life, early life. Isaac Newton was born, according to the Julian, Ju, Julian calendar, I'm trying to add another syllable in there, in the England, in use in England at the time. I think we're on the Gregorian calendar now. On Christmas Day, 25th December, 1642, new NS, 4th of January, 1643, an hour or two after midnight. 
at the Woolsthorp Manor in Woolsthorp by Calstonworth, Col- a hamlet in the county of Lincolnshire. His father, also named Isaac Newton, had died three months before. Born prematurely, Newton was a small child. His mother, Hannah Ayskoff, reportedly said that she would have, he could have fit in a quart mug. When Newton was three, his mother remarried and went to live with her new husband, the Reverend Bar- Barnabas Smith, leaving her son in the care of his maternal grandmother, Marjorie Ayskoff. The young Isaac disliked his stepfather and maintained some enmity towards his mother for marrying him, as revealed by this entry in a list of sins committed up to the age 19, threatening my father and mother Smith to burn them and the house over them. Newton's mother had three children from her second marriage. From the age of about 12 until he was 17, Newton was educated at King's School, Grantham which taught Latin, Greek, and probably imparted a significant foundation of mathematics. He was removed from school, and by October 1659, he was to be found at Woolsthorpe by Col- Col- Colsterworth, okay, I'll get that, by his mo- with his mo- where his mother, widowed for a second time, attempted to make a farmer of him. Newton hated farming. Henry Stokes, master at King's School, persuaded his mother to send him back to school so that he might complete his education. Motivated partly by a desire for revenge against a schoolyard bully, he became the top-ranked student, distinguishing himself mainly by building sundials and models of windmills. In June 1661, he was admitted to Trinity College, Cambridge, on the recommendation of his uncle, Reverend William A. Scoff, who had studied there. He started as a subsizar, paying his way by performing valet duties, until he was awarded a scholarship in 1664, guaranteeing him four more years until he could get his M.A. At that time, the college's teachings were based on those of Aristotle, whom Newton supplemented with modern philosophers such as Descartes and astronomers such as Galileo and Thomas Street, through whom he would learn of Kepler's work. He set down his, in his notebook a series of questionnaires, questionnaires, is that how that's spelled in French or something, about mechanical philosophy as he found it. In 1665, he discovered the generalized binomial theorem and began to develop a mathematical theory that later became calculus. Soon after, Newton had obtained his BA degree in August 1665, the university temporarily closed as a precaution against the Great Plague. Although he had, he had been undistinguished as a Cambridge student, Newton's private studies at his home in Woolsthorpe over the subsequent two years saw the development of his theories on calculus, optics, and the law of gravitation. In April 1667, he returned to Cambridge and in October was elected as a Trinity Fellow of Trinity. Fellows who were required to become ordained priests Although this was not enforced in the Restoration years, and as an assertion of conformity to the Church of England was sufficient. However, by 1675, the issue could not be avoided, and by then his unconventional views stood in the way. Nevertheless, Newton managed to avoid it by means of special permissions from Charles II. See Middle Years section below. Fun. His studies had impressed the Lucasian professor Isaac Barrow, who was more anxious to develop his own religious and administrative potential. He became Master of Trinity two years later. In 1669, Newton succeeded him for only one year after receiving his MA. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1672. Middle Years Mathematics Newton's work has been said to distinctly advance every branch of mathematics he studied. He wasted time on alchemy. His work on the subject, usually referred to as fluxions or calculus, seen in the manuscript of Order 1666, is now published among Newton's mathematical papers. The author of the manuscript, De, uh, sent by Isaac Barrow to John Collins in June 1669, was identified by Barrow in a letter sent to Collins in August that year as Mr. Newton, 
a fellow of our college and very young, but of an extraordinary genius and proficiency in these things. Newton later become, became involved in a dispute with Leibniz over prior, priority in the de development of calculus, the Leibniz-Newton calculus controversy. Most modern histor historians believe Newton and Leibniz developed calculus independently, although with very different notations. Occasionally it has been suggested that Newton published almost nothing about it until 1693 and did not give full account until 1704 while Leibniz began, pu began publishing a full account of his methods in 1684. Leibniz's notion and differential method nowadays recognized as much more conventional notations were adopted by continental European mathematicians, and after 1820 or so, also by British mathematicians. But such a suggestion fails to account for the content of calculus in Book I of Newton's Principia itself, published in 1687, and his forerunner manuscripts, such as Du Motu Corupum in Gyrum, on the motion of bodies in orbit in 1684. This content has been pointed out by critics of both Newton's and of the of both Newton's time and modern times. The Principia is not written in the language of calculus either, as we know it, or as Newton's later dot notion would write it. His work extensively uses calculus in geometric form based on limiting values of the ratios of vanishing small quantities. In the Principia itself, Newton gave, demonstra gave demonstration of this under the name of the, me of the method of first and last ratios and explained why he put, in, put his expositions in this form, remarking also that hereby the same thing is performed as by the methods of ind indivisibles. Because of this, the Principia has been called a book dense with, his, with theory and application of the infinitesimal calculus in modern times, and like hell is presque tout de ses calculs. Nearly all of it is of, nearly all of it is of this calculus in Newton's time. His use of his use of methods involving one or more orders of the infinitesimally small is presented in his Dumotu Corupum in Girum in 1684, and in his papers on motion during the two decades preceding 1684. Newton had been reluctant to publish his calculus because he feared controversy and criticism. He was close to the Swiss mathematician Nicolas Facio de Dullier. In 1691, Dullier started to write a new version of Newton's Principia. It corresponded with Leibniz. In 1693, the relationship between Dullier and Newton deteriorated and the book was never completed. Starting in 1699, other members of the Royal Society, of which Newton was a member, accused Leibniz of plagiarism. The dispute then broke out in full force in 1711 when the Royal Society proclaimed in a study that it was Newton who was the true discoverer and Leibniz a fraud. This study was cast into doubt when it was later found that Newton himself wrote the study's concluding remarks on Leibniz. Thus began the bitter controversy which marred the lives of both Newton and Leibniz until the latter's death in 1716. Newton is generally credited with the generalized binomial theorem, valid for any exponent. He discovered Newton's identities, Newton's method, classified cubic plane curves, polynomials of degree 3 and 2 variables, made subsequential contributions to the theory of finite differences, and was the first to use fractional indices to employ coordinate geometry to derive solutions to Diophantine equations. I think that's a cool story. I hope it goes over that more. He approximated partial sums of the harmonic series by logarithms, a precursor to Euler's simulation formula, and was the first to use power series with confidence and to revert, and to revert power series. Newton's work on infinite, seri on infinite series was inspired by Simon Stevens. Stevens' decimals. When Newton received his MA and became a fellow of the College of the Holy and Undivided Trinity in 1667, he made the commitment that I will either set theology as the object of my studies and will make it holy orders with the time prescribed 
by these stat statues by these stat statues arrival arrives what or I will resign from the college up till this point he had not thought much about religion and had twice signed his agreement to the 39 articles the basis of the Church of England a doctrine he was appointed Lucretian professor of mathematics in 1669 on Barrow's recommendation during that time, any fellow of college of the Cambridge of, of Cambridge or Oxford was required to take holy orders and became become ordained an Anglican priest. However, in terms of the Luc Lucasian professorship, the terms of the Lucasian professorship required that the order not be active in the church, presumably as to have more time for science. Newton argued that this should exempt him from the ordination requirements and Charles II, whose permission was needed, accepted this argument. Thus a conflict between Newton's religious views and Anglican orthodoxy was averted. It was averted. I'm too good for this religion thing. Yes, Newton, you're correct. Go back to work. <laughs> Optics. Ah. Optics. In 1666, Newton observed that the spectrum of colors existing, exiting a prison, prism in the position of minimal deviation is oblong, even when the light ray enters the prism is circular, which is to say the prism refracts different colors by different angles. This led him to conclude that color is property, is property intrinsic to light, a point which had been debated in prior years. From 1670 to 1672, Newton lectured on optics. During this period, he investigated the refraction of light, demonstrated that the multicolored spectrum produced by a prism could be recomposed into white light by a lens and a, spec and a second prism. Modern scholarship has revealed that Newton's analysis and resynthesis of white light owes its debt to corpuscular al alchemy. Sure. He showed that colored lights, light does not change its properties by separating out a colored beam and shining it on various objects, and that regardless of whether, the, of whether reflected, scattered, or transmitted, the light remained the same color. Thus he observed that color is the result of objects interacting with already colored light rather than objects garnering the color generating the color themselves. This is known as Newton's theory of color. From this work, he concluded that the lens of any refracting telescope would suffer from dispersion of light into colors, chromatic aberration. As, as a proof of the concept, he constructed a telescope using reflective mirrors instead of lenses as the object, uh, objective to bypass that problem. Building the design, the first known functional reflecting telescope, known, today known as the Newtonian telescope, involved solving the problem of a suitable mirror material and shaping technique. Newton ground his own mirrors into, out of a custom co composition of highly reflective spec speculum metal using, Newton, Newton, using Newton's rings to judge the quad quality of the optics for his telescopes. In late 1668, he was able to produce the first reflecting telescope. It was about eight inches long and it gave a clear and larger image. In 1671, the Royal Society asked for a demonstration of its reflecting telescope. Their interest encouraged him to publish in notes of, of colors, which he later expanded into the work Optics. When Robert Hooke criticized some of Newton's ideas, Newton was so offended that he withdrew from public debate. Newton and Hooke had brief exchanges in 1679 and 80, when Hooke appointed to when, when Hooke, appointed to manage the Royal Society's correspondence, opened up a correspondence intended to elicit contributions from Newton to Royal Society transactions, which had the effect of stimulating Newton to work out a proof that the elliptical form of planetary orbits would result from a centripetal force inversely proportional to the square of the radius vector. See Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation, History, and... Worth said I'm not trying anymore.
Now, the two men remained generally on poor terms until Hook's death. Newton wasn't a very agreeable fellow. Newton argued that light is composed of particles or corpu corpuscles, which were, were refracted by accelerating into denser medium. He verged on sound like waves to explain the repeated pattern of reflection and transportation by thin films, but still retained his theory of fits that disposed corpuscles to be reflected or transmitted. However, later physicists favored a purely wavelength explanation of light to account for the interference patterns and the general phenomenon of diffraction. Today's quantum mechanics, photons, and the idea of wave-particle duality bear, bear only a mere resemblance to Newton's understanding of light. In his Hypothesis of Light in 1675, Newton posited that the existence of the ether to transmit forces between particles. The contact with the theosophist Henry Moore revived his interest in alchemy. He replaced the ether with occult forces based on hermetic ideas of attraction or repulsion between particles. John Maynard Keynes, Keynes who acquired many of Newton's writings on alchemy, stated that Newton was not the first of, our, first of the age of reason. He was the last of the age of magicians. Newton's interest in alchemy cannot be isolated from his contributions to science. This was a time when there was no clear distinction between alchemy and science. He had not relied on the occult idea of action at a distance across a vacuum. He might not have developed his theory of gravity. See also Isaac Newton's occult studies. Uh, maybe, maybe, fine, maybe, maybe his time on alchemy wasn't such a waste. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's a wild idea here, but maybe science evolves and develops. It's not just perfect from the start. Maybe. And, and, and just, just, just maybe this, this isn't quite the end yet. Anyway, back to this. In 1704, Newton published Optics, in which he expounded his cor cor corpuscular theory of light. Man, I really want to put an S before that P. Corpuscular theory of light. He considered light to be made up of extremely subtle corpuscules that, ordinarily, that ordinary matter was made of gro grosser corpuscules and speculated that through a kind of alchemical transmutation are not gross bodies and light convertible into one another and may not bodies receive much of their activity from the particles of light which enter into their consumption newton also constructed a primitive form of frictional electrolysis electrolastic generator using a glass pro globe in an article entitled Newton Prisms and the Optics of Turnable Lasers, it is, indica it is indicated that Newton, in his book Optics, was the first to show a diagram using a prism as a beam expander. In the same book, he describes a, via diagrams the use of multiple prism arrays. Some 270 years after Newton's discussion, multiple prism beam expanders became central to the development of narrow line width tunable lasers. Also, the use of these uh, prismatic beam expanders led to the multiple prism dispersion theory. Subsequent to Newton, much had been amended. Young and Fresnel combined Newton's particle theory with Huygens' wave theory to show that color is the visible manifestation of light's wavelength. Science also slowly came to realize the difference between perception of color and mathematical optics. The German poet scientist Goethe could not shake the Newtonian foundation, but one whole Goethe did not find in Newton's armor. Newton had committed himself to the doctrine that refraction without color was impossible. He therefore thought that the object glasses, object glasses of telescopes must forever remain imperfect achromatal and refraction being incompatible. 
This inference was proven wrong by Doland. This pro this inference was proved by Doland to be wrong. A little bit of um, a little bit of uh, dyslexia setting in there. Oh man, there's a lot of sciencey stuff. Who who would have thought Newton's page would have a lot of science in it? Shocking, shocking, I tell you. Mechanics and gravitation. In 1679, Newton returned to his work on celestial mechanics by considering gravitation and its effects on the orbits of planets with reference to Kepler's laws of planetary motion. This followed stimulation by a brief exchange of letters in 1679 and 80 with Hooke, who had been appointed to manage the Royal Society's correspondence and who opened a correspondence intended to elicit contributions from Newton to Royal Society transactions. Newton's reawakening interest in astronomical matters received further stimulus by the appearance of a comet in the winter of 1680-81, to 81, on which he corresponded with John Flamsteed. After the exchange with Hooke, Newton pointed out that, point, worked out proof that the elliptical form of planetary orbits would result from a centripetal force inversely proportional to the square of the radius vector. See Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation History. Newton communicated his ideas with Edmund Halley and the Royal Society in a tract written on about nine sheets, which was copied into the Royal Society's register book in December 1684. This tract contained the nucleus that Newton developed and expanded to, the fo to form the Principia. The Principia was published on 5th of July 1687 with encouragement and financial help from Edmund Halley. In this work, Newton stated the three universal laws of motion. Together, these laws describe the relationship between any object, the forces acting upon it, and resulting motion, laying the foundation for classical mechanics. They contributed to many advances during the Industrial Revolution, which soon followed, and were not improved upon for more than 200 years. Many of these advancements continue to be underpinnings of non-relativistic technologies in the modern world. He used the Latin word gravitas, weight, for the effect that would become known as gravity, and defined the law of universal gravitation. In the same work, Newton presented a calculus-like method of geometrical analysis using first and last ratios, gave the first an analytical de determination based on Boyle's law, of the speed of sound in air, inferred the oblateness of Earth's spheroid figure, accounted for the precision of the equinoxes as a result of the moon's gravitational attraction to the, on the Earth's oblateness, initiated gravitational study on the irregularities of the motion of the moon, provided a, th provided a theory for the determination of orbits of comets and much more. more. Newton made his heliocentric view of the solar system, developed in a somewhat modern way because already in the mid-1680s he recognized the deviation of the sun from the center of gravity of the solar system. For Newton, it was not precisely the center of the sun or any other body that could be considered at rest, but rather the common center of gravity of the earth, the sun, and all the planets to be esteemed the center of the world. And this center of gravity either is at rest or moves uniformly to forward in a right line. Newton adopted the at-rest alternative in view of common uh, consent that the center, wherever it was, was at rest. Newton's postulate of invis an invisible force able to act over vast distances led him to be criticized for introducing occult agencies into science. Later, in the second edition of Principia, Newton firmly rejected such criticisms in a concluding general scolium, writing that it was that the phenomenon implied a gravitational attraction, as it did, but it did not insofar indicate its cause, and it was both unnecessary and improper to frame hypotheses of things that were not implied by phenomenon. Here, Newton used what became his famous exposition, Hypothesis non fingo. With the Principia, Newton became internally, internationally recognized. He acquired a circle of admirers, including Swiss-born mathematician Nicolas Facio de Dullier. Another, another sip of water here. Water. 
classification of cubics. Descartes was the most important early influencer on Newtonian, on Newton, the mathematician. Newton classified the cubic curves in the plane. He found 72 of the 78 species of cubes. He also divided them into four types, satisfying different equations. And in 1717, Sterling, probably with Newton's help, proved that every cubic was of these four types. Newton also claimed that the four types could be obtained by plane projection from one of them. And this was proved in, eight, in 1731. Later life. In the 1690s, Newton wrote a number of religious tracts dealing with the illiteral and symbolic interpretation of the Bible. A manuscript Newton sent to John Locke in which he disputed the fidelity of 1 John 5 7 and its fidelity in the original manuscripts of the New Testament remained unpublished until 1785. Even though a number of authors have claimed that the work that the work might have been an indication that Newton was disputed in, in brief in Trinity, others assure that Newton did question the passage but never denied Trinity as such. His biographer, scientist Sir David Brewster, who compiled his manuscripts for over 20 years, wrote about the controversy in his well-known book, M Memoirs of the Life, writing, Writings and Discoveries of Sir Isaac Newton, where he explains that Newton questioned the veracity of these passages, but never denied the doctrine of the Trinity as such. Brewster stated that Newton was never known as an Arian, as an Arian during his time, it was first William Whiston of Ararian who are, or, yeah, who argued that Sir Isaac Newton was so hardy for the Baptists as well as for the Yesubians or Arians. That's not Arian. That's Ararian. Ararian. I don't know. That he sometimes suspected, though these two were the two witnesses in the revelations. While well, others like Hopton Haynes, a mint employee and humanitarian, mentioned to Richard Braun that Newton held the same doctrine as himself. Later works, The Chronology of Ancient Kingdoms Amended, and Observations Upon the Prophecies of Daniel and the Apocalypse of St. John, 1733, were published after his death. He was also devoted he also devoted a great deal of time to alchemy. See above. Oh, this is see above now. That means we're, we're well on our way. Newton was also a member of the Parliament of England for, university, for Cambridge University in 1689 and 90, in 1701 to 2. But according to some accounts, he only, his only comments were to campaign about a cold drought in the chamber and request that the window be closed. He was, however, noted by Cambridge diarist Abram de la Prime to have rebuked students who were f uh, f frightening local residents by claiming that a house was haunted. Newton moved to London to take up the post of warden of the Royal Mint in 1696, a position that he had obtained through the patronage of, Saint of Charles Monta Montague, first Earl of Halifax, then Chancellor of the Exchange Exchequer. He took charge of England's great recoining, somewhat tre uh, treading on the toes of Lord Lucas, governor of the tower, tower and, secu and securing the job of deputy, deputy comptroller of the, depu of the temporary Chester branch for Edmund Haley. Newton became perhaps the best known master of the mint upon his death, upon the death of Thomas Neal in 1699, a position Newton held for the last 30 years of his life. These appointments were intended as uh, sincuers, but Newton took them seriously, retiring from his Cambridge duties in 1701 and exercising his power to, perform, to reform currency and punish clippers and counterfeiters. As warden and afterwards master of the Royal Mint, Newton estimated that 20% of the coins taken during the Great Recoinage of 1796 were counterfeit. Counterfeiting was high treason, punishable by the felon being hanged, drawn, and quartered. Despite this, convicting even the most flagrant criminals could hardly could be extremely difficult. However, Newton proved equal to the task. Disguised as a habit, 
habitué of bars and taverns, he gathered much of that evidence himself. For the barriers placed to, placed to prosecution and separating the branches of government, English law still had ancient and formidable customs of authority. Noon had himself made a justice of the pe- had himself made a justice of the peace in all com- home com- counties. There's a draft of a letter regarding this matter stuck in Newton's personal first edition of his Principia Naturalis Principia, the Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica, in which he have, must have been amending at the time. Then he conducted more than 100 cross-examinations of witnesses, informers, and suspects between June 1698 and Christmas 1699. Newton successfully prosecuted 28 coiners. As a result of a report written by Newton on 21st of September 1717, the Lord's commissions of His Majesty's Treasury, the bimetallic relationship between gold coins and silver coins, was changed by royal proclamation on 22nd of December 1717, forbidding the exchange of gold guineas for more than 21 silver shillings. This inadvertently resulted in a silver shortage as silver coins were used to pay for imports, while exports were paid for or in gold, effectively moving Britain from the silver standard to its first gold standard. It is a matter of debate as to whether he intended to do this or not. It has been argued that Newton conceived of his work at the Mint as a continuation of his alchemical work. Newton was made president of the Royal Society in 1703 and an association of the French Academy des Sciences. In his position at the Royal Society, Newton made an enemy of John Flamsteed, the Astronomer Royal, by prematurely publishing Flamsteed's Historia Coelis, Coestis Britannica, which Newton had used in, in his studies. In April 1705, Queen Anne knighted Newton during a royal visit to Trinity College, Cambridge. The knighthood is likely to have been motivated by political considerations connected with the parliamentary elections in May 1705, rather than any recognition of Newton's scientific work or service as Master of Mint. Newton was the second scientist to be knighted after Sir Sir Francis Bacon. Newton was one of many people who lost heavily when when the South Sea Company collapsed, the most significant trade were sl- was slaves, and according to his niece, he lost around 20,000 pounds. Toward the end of his life, Newton took up residence in Canbury Park, near Winchester, where his, with his niece and her husband, until his death in 1727. His half-niece, Catherine Barton Conduit, served as his hostess in social affairs at his house on Jermyn Street in London. He was her very loving uncle, according to his letter to, to her when she was recovering from smallpox. Newton died in his sleep in London on the 20th of March, 1727, or 31st of March, and was buried in Westminster Abbey. Voltaire may have been present at his funeral. Sweet. A bachelor. He, is divest- he had divested much of his estate to relatives during his last years and died in, in, in his state. His papers went to John Conduit and Catherine Barton. After his death, Newton's hair was examined and found to contain mercury, probably resulting from his alchemical pursuits. Mercury poisoning could explain Newton's eccentricity in late life. Personal Relations Although it was claimed that he was once engaged, Newton never married. The French writer-philosopher Voltaire, who was in London at the time of Newton's funeral, said that he was never sensible to any passion, was not subject to the common frailties of mankind, nor had any commerce with women, a circumstance which was assured me by the uh, physician and surgeon who attended him in his last moments. The widespread belief that he died a virgin has been commented on by writers such as mathematician Charles Hutton, economist John Maynard Keyes, and physicist Carl Sagan. Newton did have a close friendship with Swiss mathematician Nicolas Facio Dullier, whom he met in London in 1689. The intense relationship came to an 
abrupt and unexplained end in 1693, and at the same time Newton suffered a nervous breakdown. Some of their correspondence has survived. In September of that year, Newton had broken, uh, had a breakdown, which was, which included sending wild accusatory letters to his friends Samuel Pepe, Peps, Pepe's and John Locke. His note to the latter included the charge that Locke endeavored to embroil me with women. <laughs> what a what a charge that jerk Locke. Fame, uh, after death. Fame, the mathematician, Joseph Louis Lagrange, Lagrange, said that Newton was the greatest genius who ever lived, and once added that Newton was also the most fortunate, for we cannot find more than once a system of the, of the world to establish. English poet Alexander Pope wrote the famous epitaph, Nature and nature's laws lay hidden in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. Newton was relatively modest about his achievements, writing in a letter to Robert, Robert Hooke in February 17, 1676, If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Stick on to the end to see what that's about. Two writers think that above the above quotation, written at, at a time when Newton and Hooke were in dispute over optical discoveries, was an oblique attack on Hooke, said to have been short and hunch, hunchbacked, rather than, or in addition to, a statement of modesty. On the other hand, the widely known proverb about standing on the shoulders of giants, published among others by 17th century poet George Hubert, a former orator of the University of Cambridge and a fellow of Trinity College, in his Jacula Predentum, 1651, had as, it, as its main point that a dwarf on a giant's shoulders sees, farther than, sees further of the two. And so its effect, as an analogy, would place Newton himself rather than Hook as the dwarf. In a later memoir, Newton wrote, I do not know what I may appear to the world, but to myself, I seem only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself now and then, finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great, great ocean of truth lay undiscovered before me. Oh, man. In 1816, a tooth said to have belonged to Newton was sold for 730 pounds in London to an aristocrat who had it set in a ring. The Guinness World Records 2002 classified it as the most valuable tooth, which would value approximately 25,000 uh, pounds, or 35,700 in uh, late 20, 2001. Who bought it and who currently has, has it, who bought it and who currently has it has not been disclosed. That's crazy. That tooth's got to be, that ring is nuts. Somebody should do a movie where that's the item of chase. Albert Einstein kept a picture of Newton on his study wall alongside ones of Michael Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell. Newton remains influential to today's scientists, as demonstrated by a 2005 survey of the members of, the Royal, of Britain's Royal Society, formerly headed by, New, formerly headed by Newton asking who had the greater effect on the history of science, Newton or Einstein. Oh, what? Newton remains influential as these. There's a that I'm certain of. From asking, oh wow, okay. Royal Society scientists deemed Newton to have made the greater overall contribution. In 1999, an opinion poll of 100 of today's leading physicists voted Einstein the greatest physicist ever, with Newton the runner-up, while a parallel survey of rank-and-file physicists by the site PhysWeb, PhysicsWeb gave the spot to Newton. Ooh. Commem commemorations. Man. Commemorations. Newton's monument, 1731, can be seen in Westminster Abbey at the north of the entrance to the choir against the choir screen. 
near his tomb. It was executed by the sculptor Michael Rizbrack, 1694 to 1770, in white and gray marble with design by the architect William Kent. The monument features a figure of Newton reclining on top of a sarcophagus, his right elbow resting on several of his great books, and his left hand pointing to a scroll with mathematical design. Above him is a pyramid and a celestial globe showing the signs of the zodiac and the path of the comet of 1680. A relief panel depicts Pudi using instruments such as a telescope and prism. The Latin inscription on the base translates as, Here is buried Isaac Newton, knight, who by a strength of mind almost divine, by mathematical principles particularly his own, peculiar, principles peculiarly his own, he explored the course and figures of the planets, the paths of comets, the tides of the sea, the, sim the similarities in rays of light, and what no other scholar had previously imagined, the properties of the colors thus produced. Diligent, sa sa sag sagacious, and faithful. In his exp expositions of nature, antiquity, and the holy scriptures, he vindicated by his philosophy the majesty of God mighty and good, and expressed the simplicity of the gospel in his manners. Mortals rejoice that, he, that there has existed such and so great an ornament of the human race. He was born 25th of December, 1642, died March 20th, 1726, 27? What? Translated from G.L. Smith, Monuments, and Genie of St. Peter's Cathedral of Westminster Abbey. From 1978 until 1988, an image of, uh, of Newton designed by Harry, by Harry Ecclestone appeared on Series D1 banknotes issued by Bank of England, the last $1 notes to be issued by the Bank of England. Newton was shown on the reverse of the notes, holding a book accompanied by a telescope, a prism, and a map of the solar system. A statue of Isaac Newton looking at an apple at his feet can be seen at Oxford University Museum of Natural History. A large bronze statue, Newton after William Blake by Eduardo Paolozzi, dated 1995 and inspired by Blake's etchings, dominates the piazza of the British Library in London. Religious views. Although born into an Anglican family, by his 30s, Newton held a Christian faith that, had it been made public, would not have been considered orthodox by mainstream Christianity. In recent times, he has been described as a heretic. By 1672, he had started to record his theological researchers, researches in notebooks which he showed to no one and which have only recently been examined. They demonstrate an extensive knowledge of early church writings and show that in the conflict between Athenius and Arius, which defied, defined the creed, he took the side of Arius, the loser, who rejected the conventional view of the Trinity. Newton recognized Christ as a divine men mediator between God and man, who was subordinate to the Father who created him. He was especially interested in prophecy, but for him, the great apostasy was uh, Trinitarianism. Newton tried unsuccessfully to obtain one of the two fellowships that exempted the holder from ordainship requirement. At the last moment in 1775, he received a dispensation from the government that excused him of all future holders and all future holders of the Lucasian chair. In Newton's eyes, worshiping Christ as God was idolatry, to him the fundamental sin. Historian Stephen S. Snobinell, Snob, Snobellin says, Isaac Newton was a heretic, but he never made public, a public declaration of his private faith, which the Orthodox would have deemed extremely radical. He also hid his faith so well that scholars are still unraveling his personal beliefs. Snobillen 
concludes that Newton was at least a Socinian sympathizer. He owned and had thoroughly read at least eight Socinian books, possibly an Arian and mostly and certainly an anti-Trinitarian. In a minority view, T.C. Feismenayer argues that Newton held the Eastern Orthodox view of the Trinity. However, this type of view has lost support of late with the availability of Newton's theological papers, and most scholars identify Newton as anti-Trinitarian monotheist. Although the laws of motion and universal gravitation became Newton's best-known discoveries, he warned against using them to view the universe as a mere machine, as if akin to a great clock. He says, gravity, he said, gravity explains the motion of the planets, but it cannot explain who, the, who set the planets in motion. God governs all things and knows that all, all that is or can be done. Along with his scientific fame, Newton's studies of the Bible and of early church fathers were also noteworthy. Newton wrote works on textual criticisms, most notably an historical account of two notable corruptions of scripture and observations upon the prophecies of Daniel and the apocalypse of St. John. He placed the crucifixion of Jesus Christ at 3rd of April, A.D. 33, which agrees with one traditionally accepted date. He believes in a rationally imminent world, but he had rejected the hylosicism implicit in Leibniz and Barak Spinoza. He ordered a dynamic informed universe that could be understood and must be understood by, by an active reason. In his correspondence, Newton claimed that in writing the Principia, I had an eye upon such principles as might work with considering men for the belief of a deity. He saw evidence of design in the system of the world. Such a wonderful uniformity in the planetary systems must be allowed the effect of choice. But Newton insisted that divine intervention would eventually require, be required to reform the system due to the slow growth of instabilities. For this, Leibniz lamp lampooned him. God, God Almighty wants to wind up his watch from time to time, otherwise it would cease to move. Had he not, it seemed sufficient foresight to make, the, make it a perpetual motion. Newton's position was vigorously defended by his followers, Samuel Clark, a famous, in a famous correspondence. A century later, Pierre-Simon Laplace's work Celestial Mechanics had a natural explanation for why planets' orbit did not require periodic divine intervention. Effect on Religious Thought Newton and Robert Boyle's approach to the mechanical philosophy was prompted by rationalist pamphleteers as the viable alternative to the pantheists and eutheists, and was accepted hesitantly by orthodox preachers as well as dissident preachers like the Latitudarians. Latitudinarians. The clarity and simplicity of science was seen as a way to combat the emotional and metaphysical superlatives of both superstitious euth enthusiasm and the threat of atheism. And at the same time, the second wave of English deists used Newton's discoveries to demonstrate the possibility of a natural religion. The attacks made against pre against pre enlightenment magical thinking and the mystical elements of Christianity were given their foundation with Boyle's mechanical concept conception of the universe. Newton gave Boyle's ideas their completion through mechanical proofs and, perhaps more importantly, was successful in popularizing them. Occult. In a manuscript he wrote in 1704, in which he describes his attempts to extract scientific information from the Bible, he estimated that the world would end no earlier than, 16, than 2060. In, a prediction this he, in predicting this, he said, This I mention not to assert when the time of the end shall be, but to put a stop to the rash conjectures of fanciful men who are frequently predicting the end, time of the end, and by doing so bring sacred prophecies 
into discredit as often as their predictions fail. Alchemy. In the character of Morton Opperly's in the character of Morton Opperly in Poor Superman, nineteen fifty one, speculative fiction author Fries Leiber says of Newton Everyone knows Newton as the great scientist. Few remember that he spent half his life muddling with alchemy, looking for the philosopher's stone. That was the pebble by the seashore he really wanted to find. Of an estimated 10 million words of writing in Newton's papers, about 1 million deal with alchemy. Many of Newton's writings on alchemy are copies of other manuscripts with his own annotations. Alchemical texts mix artisanal knowledge with philosophical speculation, often hidden behind layers of wordplay, allegory, and imagery to protect craft secrets. Some of the content contained in Newton's papers could have been considered heretical by the church. In 1888, after spending 16 years cataloging Newton's papers, Cambridge University kept a small number and returned the rest to the Earl of Portsmouth. In, 13, in, 13, in 1936, a descendant uh, offered the papers for sale at uh, Sotheby's. The collection was broken up and sold for a total of £9,000. John Maynard Keyes was one of about three dozen bidders who obtained part of the collection at auction. Keynes wanted to went on to reassemble an estimated half of Newton's collection of papers on alchemy before denoting his, donating his collection to Cambridge University in 1946. All of Newton's known writings on alchemy are currently being put online in a project undertaken by Indiana University, the, chemist, the chemistry of Sir Isaac Newton. Newton's fundamental contributions to science include the quantification of gravitational attraction, discovery of white light is actually a mixture of immutable spectral colors, and the formation of calculus. Yet there is another more mysterious side of Newton that is imperfectly known, a realm of activity that spans some 30 years of his life, although he kept it largely hidden from his contemporaries and colleagues. We refer to Newton's involvement in the discipline of alchemy, or as it was often called in the 17th century England, Chemistry. Enlightenment philosophers. Enlightenment, philosoph Enlightenment philosophers who uh, chose a short history of scientific predecessors. Galileo, Boyle, and Newton principally, as the guides and guarantors of their applications of the singular concept of nature and natural law to every physical and social field of the day. In this respect, the lessons of history and social structures built upon it could be discarded. It was Newton's con conception of the universe based upon natural and rationally understandable laws that became one of the seeds of, for Enlightenment ideology. Locke and Voltaire applied concepts of natural law to political systems, advocating intrinsic rights. The, philosoph the philosoph physiocrats and Adam Smith applied natural conceptions of philosophy and self, of psychology and self-interest to economic systems. The sociologists criticized the current social order for trying to fit history into natural molds of progression. Mondodo, Monbodo, and Samuel Clark resisted elements of Newton's of Newton's work, but eventually rationalized it to conform with their strong religious views of nature. The, the famous apple incident. Ooh, it gets its own section. Thank God. <sighs> Newton himself often told the story that he was inspired to formulate his theory of gravitation by watching the fall of an apple from a tree. Although it is said that the apple, that the apple story is a myth and that he did not arrive at his theory of gravity in any, singular, in any single moment, acquaintances of Newton, such as William Stuckley, whose manuscript accounted, account of 1752 has been made available by the Royal Society, do in fact confirm the incident, though not the cartoon version that the apple actually hit Newton's head. Stuckley recorded this in his Memoirs of Sir Isaac Newton's Life, a conversation with Newton in Kensington on April 15, uh, 1726. Starting to lose it. 
He went into the garden and drank, and drank thee under the shade of some apple trees, only he and myself. Amidst other discourse, he told me that he was in just the same situation as when formerly uh, the notion of gravitation came into his mind. Why should that apple always descend perpendicularly to the ground? The thought he to himself occasioned by the fall of the apple as he sat in a contemplative mood. Why should it not go sideways or upwards, constantly to the earth's center? Assuredly, the reason is that the earth draws it. There must be a drawing power in this matter, and some of the drawing power in the sum of the earth must, not, must be in the earth's center, not in any, of the, in any side of the earth. Therefore, does this apple fall perpendicularly or towards the center? If matter thus draws matter, it must be in proportion of its quantity. Therefore, the apple draws the earth as well as the earth draws the apple. John Conduit, Newton's assistant at Royal Mint and husband of Newton's niece, also described the event when he wrote of Newton's life. In the year 1666, he retired again from Cambridge to his mother in Lincolnshire. Whilst he was pensively meandering in a garden, it came into his thought that the power of gravity, which brought an apple from a tree to the ground, was not limited to a certain distance from the earth, but that this power extended much further than was usually thought. Why not as high as the moon, said he to himself, and if so, that must influence her motion, and perhaps retain her in orbit, whereupon he fell a, a, cal fell a calculating what would be the effect of that supposition. In similar terms, Voltaire wrote in his essay on, poet, on epic poetry, Sir Isaac Newton, walking in his gardens, had first thought into the system of gravitation upon seeing an apple falling from a tree. It is known from his notebooks that Newton was grappling in the late 1660s with the idea that terrestrial gravity extends in an inverse square proportion to the moon. However, it took him two decades to develop the fully-fledged theory. The question is not whether gravity existed, but whether it extended so far from the Earth as it could be the force holding the moon in orbit. Newton showed that the for if the force decreased as the inverse square of the distance, one could indeed calculate the moon's orbital period and get a good agreement. He guessed that the same force was responsible for other orbital motions and hence named it universal gravitation. Various trees are claimed to be the apple tree, which Newton describes. The King School, Grantham, claims the tree was purchased by the school, uprooted and transported to the headmaster's garden some years later. The staff of the now National Trust owned uh, Woolsthorpe Manor dispute this and claim that a tree present in their garden is the one described by Newton. A descendant of the original tree can be seen growing outside of the main gate in Trinity College, Cambridge, below the room Newton lived in while he studied there. The National Fruit Collection at Broggale can supply grass from their tree, which appears identical to the flower of Kent, a coarse flesh cooking variety. A coarse fleshed cooking variety. Oh. And that is that, ladies and gentlemen. Isaac Newton, badass of history. I've always sort of been a bit resentfully wasted time on uh, the occult and his religious studies, but actually reading that seems like it was um, almost a necessary background from to come to the other conclusions he came to that others were missing. So, I guess I have to retract that resentment. You're now back to 100% fucking sick. Uh, all right. Tune in next week. Uh, gonna fill in the next of a relevant three, and then probably a reveal at the end of those three. So you can, you can stop listening now. Oh, you should probably uh subscribe. If you've listened to this far, you should really subscribe. Get more of this shit later. Bye for now. Praise Keck.